That's the one thing about our audience. They always want a new guy to break through the glass ceiling. And all you have to do is just be real. Allow me to reintroduce myself. I am the jabroni beating, pie eating, trail blazing, eyebrow raising, talking is done, you're out of your class, no sleep till Brooklyn, the rock whips your ass. Woo! I wish you and King would quit talking. Welcome to Around the Ring episode 90. It is April 9th, 2017, Sunday morning. I'm one half of your host, Dave Brown, joined with, as always, by my good buddy, Floyd Johnson Jr. How are you doing this morning? I am doing well. This is day 17 of 17 days off. Good so, God. Uh, so I am uh, nice and rested. I'm actually ready to start the grind again at work, but... The good Lord, you never should take this many days off because you understand what life is like without work. And I don't think most people think life without work is a bad thing. Did you get bored after a while? No, not at all. <laughs> no. I mean, well, let's see, 13 of the 17 days was at WrestleMania. Um, then everything else was before getting ready for WrestleMania and then hadn't seen my girl in 13 days, so... We spent time together over the last few days. So I never got bored. Well, good. Staying awake yesterday was hard. I wanted my nap. And then I realized, uh, you know, I need to stop napping to prepare for, you know, going back to work. Yeah, yeah, you're, that's going to be an adjustment because you're probably back used to, you know, being awake during the day. And now that's going to have to change. So, yeah. Man. It'll, take, it'll, ta- it'll take about a week and I'll be fine. Okay, so before we get into all the post mania stuff that happened, tell overall what was how how was Florida? Okay, um, Disney and Universal, I will never do it like that again. Even though I enjoyed both of them, I don't feel like I got to see as much as I wanted to see because I didn't have you know I I, I did two days for Disney, and one of those days was a Monday, which is if you find out, it's the busiest day of the week at the park. I did not know that. I would assume it was be one of the slowest days, but it's the busiest days. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, we did Universal. And, and it was just at the end of that, that fourth day, our legs and knees were shot from Universal. So we didn't get to enjoy it as much. So if I did Disney and Universal again, I would do it. First of all, I would lose a lot of weight first. Second of all, uh, I would do it as just a trip on its own, not as a part of a much longer trip. That makes sense. Uh, but and, I had a good time. Good. I enjoyed it immensely. What was your What was your biggest highlight from the entire experience? Um, the revival debuting. Oh yes, that was so great. I mean, I mean, I mean the whole. There was the thank you taker. As far as wrestling stuff, thank you taker was cool. Uh, I mean, all the shows were amazing, but uh, the revival debuting, I I wanted it SmackDown. Well, we'll talk more about that later. But that was my favorite experience, and I've I've told people before I don't go to WrestleMania for the show. I go for the people. I go for the camaraderie uh, of being with other fans. I mean. WrestleMania is basically your, if I mean, the easiest way to think of it is if your favorite TV show had a convention, and then you watch the uh, you watch the season finale together. Oh well, yeah, that's a that's actually a really good way of putting it. Yeah, so that's I mean that's what it is. It's like you're talking to the people, you mean line, you making new contacts. Um, I think the club went from uh, like 68 members to I think we're at 85 now. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and I mean that was you know it's cool, and I got to meet my Euro pals, and it was just that that's part just getting in line and talking. It's funny because sometimes you're in the line and all that stuff, and you meet non-social wrestling fans, which is weird. Because I'll talk to anybody about wrestling. I'll talk to someone that hasn't watched wrestling in 10 years about wrestling but you got those people that clearly don't want to talk to you or anybody and it's like it's kind of funny to me because I am a very 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 social person 
That you are. That you are. Well, <laughs> non-social wrestling fans. That's a, yeah, they are very, like, they just want to meet the wrestler. Don't talk to me. I don't want to be here. I just want to meet the wrestler and go to the next wrestler. Interesting. I mean, in, it's all types, you know. I've heard of uh, being a wrestling fan, helping people with social anxiety disorders, or coming out of their shells, or whatever. Maybe it's something I don't understand, which, I mean, no, it's not maybe. It is something I don't understand. And, but, you know, that's the great thing about wrestling fans. It's so many different types. There's lawyers, there's doctors, there's all sorts of people that uh, watch wrestling all day. I mean, of course, I'm an IT guy. There's people that do all the retail. There's people that, you know, literally scratch and save so they can go to WrestleMania every year. Some people, it's a lot easier. I met this guy, and he says, I buy the highest package every year. The highest package is ten grand. Good God. Yeah, so he buys it every year. And the way he said it was like, no skin off my back. And I was like, I tip my hat, and I was like, I can't roll like that. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm comfortable in life, don't get me wrong, but ten grand every year, couldn't do it. That's like half of my yearly salary. Wow. Um, I mean, damn. I'm glad. Let me just say this: I'm glad you love what you do, Dave, because that just made me sad. <laughs> well, a little less than half, but yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, yeah, like I said, it would be a significant part of my salary. And if I really just wanted to like eat ramen the rest of my life, I could do it. But I have other interests, so I'm not going to ever try to do it. Man, well, let's uh, let's talk about the shows. So, um, now, as far as a an experience there from watching the shows, you were at you were at Takeover, you were at Mania, you were at Raw, SmackDown, uh, and then the NXT tapings. Were those at Full Sail, by the way? Yes. yes. Oh, you got the Full Sail experience, lucky bastard. Okay, good. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing some reports on that. The only thing about Full Sail, and I'll say this before we get, it was day five of five days of shows. I was into my, uh, with WrestleMania being like seven hours long, uh, I was at the NXT Live, that was three hours, uh, Raw was three hours, no, Raw was, uh, the show was three hours, and it started about 30 minutes before, so that was three and a half hours, you see where I'm getting at. You were exhausted. NXT in the, the NXT live tapings did not get the best version of Floyd. Now, I was I was so tired of watching wrestling at that point. <laughs> was most of the crowd pretty tired by that point? Were they? Were uh, I let me just say a lot of the crowd got tired at the end of WrestleMania, but uh, NXT I think a lot of people that came back. But you could tell the people that it was their fifth show in five days. Five days. Okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah, we were we were just, and it wasn't anything to do with the show. It was just I was tired. Well, yeah. I mean, that's. <laughs> and I'm glad I. I'm glad I can say I did it, but I won't do it again. <laughs> that's you know that's fair. Because that yeah, is. I'm glad, I, I'm glad I can put that on my man. I did five days of five shows. I went to everything. Next year, it will. I, I will just. I would just skip if they did the NXT live tapings. I would skip that part. I would do the four shows in four days because I was fine through SmackDown, but by that Wednesday, I was ready to go home. Yeah, I can see that. And it, well, with the, I mean, the the whole SmackDown thing is you here. You've because it's in Orlando. You've got this chance to to see it in full sale. Which is, I mean, Full Sail is kind of one of those destinations. It's kind of like the place where PWG is recorded. You know, people want to have an experience there. Uh, so, so yeah, I could definitely see if it's, if let's say, I don't know, one year it's in Cleveland. And you've gone through four days worth of shows at least. And they're like, hey, we're going to do an NXT taping at, at this building. I can definitely see people going, no, thank you. Um, and just been leaving at that point but i mean for full sale it was that made sense to, to go to that i've already planned well i had to book my hotel already and i'm already planning my trip for next year and i'm gone on wednesday no matter what <laughs> i like i don't care what happens <laughs> there you go unless i mean 
it have to be like a Undertaker and Hulk Hogan dual signing for me to stay that Wednesday or something like that. that I'm getting out of there. But but Floyd, you had many opportunities to get signings with Hulk Hogan over this last week. I heard the breakdown of the number of times and places that fool was doing signings, and it was ridiculous. He wanted one hundred and fifty dollars. No, no. And with all the other money I was spending, I I could have I could have done it. I could have done it. And I was just like, no. I mean, if he does a, if hopefully he comes back to WWE and he does like a premium VIP with them, maybe I'll do it. But one hundred and fifty bucks. Just to meet Hulk Hogan, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and yeah, he's kind of from all from everything you can tell. He's kind of a dick. He's the, he's the last one I don't have though. I got Rick. I got Hogan. I mean, I mean, I got Rick. I got Undertaker. I got Sean. I got Brett. He's the one I don't have. Ah, okay. So I will probably spend the money. It's not. Well, that makes sense. Well, let's talk about Monday Night Raw. So, uh, Raw again from Orlando, same building that Takeover was in. Uh, was it? So it was. It was interesting. This this Mania crowd on TV, at least, they were very boisterous. But it was it was just a slightly different. I don't know. It. I don't know if it it seemed more. It was uh, fun. It was more angry. Okay. Yeah. I will say that, in my opinion, even even being in it since I've, I mean, this is my fourth one in a row. Uh, New Orleans, uh, New Orleans um, was fun. California was fun. It was all about uh, uh, having the fun part. Like what happened with Sheamus and Cesaro, that was like the whole show. A lot of just singing songs. One time we even had the rivalry of it was travel package. Versus the people that didn't get the travel package. Dallas was even fun. This one, people were angry. It was anger. Yeah, and so, yeah, let, let's talk about it. The, the, the show opened up with this really long set of Undertaker chants, which was really, really cool. Yes, that and was then, awesome. And then Roman Reigns comes out, and, and you know, I, will, I think he played this well. Uh, because I loved every time he would raise the mic you guys would start booing and uh the, there were roman chants sucks there were fucky roman ch- chants and it was just he'd just stand there and wait and they'd lift the mic boo and it's like yeah. as soon as you guys would start to die down lift the mic boo and and that went on for a very long time um, the loudest thing i've ever heard in a wrestling i mean it, it was right there with yes at the end of wrestlemania 30 as part of the loudest thing I've ever heard. So if, if they really need to use this as, even if it's not a full-blown heel turn, needs to, he just needs to be a cocky dick from now on. And uh, well, the, the thing is, with Roman, I, um, you know, everyone was like, I hate Roman, I hate Roman, I hate Roman. And I was like, okay, the WWE, JBL, um, especially JBL, Jim Ross, they have told you how to get rid of Roman Reigns and how to get them to change Roman Reigns' character if you want them to. They've told you a hundred times. It's the same way. This is the sentence that they say. They may boo him, they may cheer him, but they always react. That's what they say. You've heard that said before, right? Oh, yeah. All right. So, they are giving you the blueprint to get rid of Roman Reigns if you really want to get Roman Reigns. Get rid of Roman Reigns. Don't react. When he comes out, sit on your hands and shut up. But, no one does that. So I have come to the conclusion no one actually hates Roman Reigns. No, I don't, I think people, here's the thing, I think people don't hate him. They yeah. hate the way he's booked. And yes. And, Booing just makes them keep booking him that way. Which is, but the thing is, though, and this is something I heard on another show, is, is that they, Vince especially, sees Reigns as, you know, the next John Cena level guy. Uh-huh. But and he is. He see, has everything you need. 
other than he is he's not likable. He is I don't think I think he his level and I'm totally to give credit where credit was due. Uh I first heard this mention on Voices of Wrestling. Uh he his level, his his ceiling is Randy Orton. He will never get past the Randy Orton level. Uh primarily because he does not connect well or has not figured out a way yet to really connect with people. Um, Because you think of the absolute super megastars, even John Cena. John Cena connects very well with certain segments of the audience. And even the people who cannot stand John Cena, you put him in there with a an AJ Styles, a Cesaro, a CM Punk, and people lose their damn minds because the matches are incredible. Um, you you then look think of somebody like um, a Daniel Bryan who really connected with people, even you know Stone Cold or The Rock or Hogan who connected with people. Roman does not have that connection with people and i don't know if he ever will just i i I honestly don't think he's ever really had the chance he has truly been the same character since the shield seth rollins has evolved uh dean ambrose has devolved but uh roman reigns is the exact same guy exact same moves Exact same music. Exact same what he wears. Exactly. That's the problem with Roman Reigns. Everyone was expecting more. I was expecting more. He's the same guy he was in the Shield. Everybody in the Shield has changed. He hasn't. I don't know if he can connect the fans. He hasn't been really given a chance. He can't connect the fans in that robotic uh I'm I'm the biggest badass in the world character. Yeah, I I but, I mean, I don't think I mean, he was the badass of the shield. He uh, Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose would actually cut the promo and he would come in and say, "Believe that." Yeah. I That's it. That was that was who he was. And, and you know, they're not doing this guy any favors, not giving him the chance to evolve. People have actually connected with Seth Rollins at this point. Not, exactly. Not in any, you know, not in a super way, but they've connected with him. And I just don't, if if Vince is, is convinced that this is the path he wants to go down, Roman Reigns will never become a super megastar. He will be a very big star, a Randy Orton level star, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Most most wrestlers would give their left nut and right eye to have that kind of career. Well, the problem is, look at this. You know who's number one in merchandise sales in WWE? Roman Reigns, apparently. Roman Reigns. You know who's main event at the last three WrestleManias? Yeah, I know. Okay, but, so say he's not going to be hit this level. He's there. The thing, though, just selling T-shirts to kids doesn't automatically make you someone who's truly connecting with the crowd in that way. That is true, and that is for people like us, people we consider ourselves like pundits, fans that have an opinion. But the WWE, on its highest level, and I hate being reminded of this in JBL and Bubba Ray because they, they just sound like a... Uh, They sound like a broken record that they only have one thought in the world. It is a business, and their job is to make money. True. But the reason they never got rid of John Cena or never turned him heel, because they were afraid of what it would do for merchandise sales. But John Cena is more than, if you you look at the numbers, John Cena is more than merch sales. John Cena affects house show attendance. If yeah, he is well, on a house like, show, more people show up. Roman Reigns has not done that yet. Yeah, uh, this was a point I was going to actually make to JBL and Bubba Ray, but I realized their communication is such one-sided, I don't like really calling in the radio shows and stuff, because they can just hang up on you and ignore you, right? Right. I watch football, and I'm going to use real sports to make a, uh, a default, uh, make a point here. I'm a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Kansas City Chiefs have a quarterback named Alex Smith, right? 
Okay. I don't like Alex Smith. Don't think he's a very good quarterback. Not a fan of Alex Smith, right? Yeah. When Kansas City has football games, I still go to games. Am I going to the game to watch Alex Smith? No. All right. So JBL and uh, JBL and Bubba Ray's like they're still selling out tickets. Well, I went to WrestleMania personally to see Kevin Owens, Chris Jericho, um, the the club. I could go through a name. I like ninety percent of the roster. Did I pay to watch Roman Reigns versus Undertaker? No. The Roman Reigns and Undertaker was just on the card. I, you know, my money, of course, goes to them. And when you look at it, like Roman Reigns sold out WrestleMania. Roman Reigns did not sell out WrestleMania. WrestleMania sold out WrestleMania, and Roman Reigns just happened to be on the card. Exactly. And they can't, I mean, they can't make that. That is such, if that is the conclusion they're making. The, they make that point quite a bit. See, and that's that with with especially with with uh, Mania is silly because going into that show, they never announced what the main event actually was. It was <laughs> never said what the final match was until we were watching the show and kind of put it together. Okay, this is going to be the last match. Yeah, you got to show me that the ticket numbers boosted after Roman Reigns and Undertaker was announced. Exactly. That's what you have to show me. Because I bought my ticket not knowing one match on the card. Right. And and WrestleMania is not... That's like buying tickets to the Super Bowl. Super Bowl is going to sell out before the season starts. Yes. Why? Because it's a freaking Super Bowl. And yeah. It, it you, show me, yeah. you show me Ro- uh, a Roman Reigns selling out the loose Minnesota, then I'll jump on your side. Exactly. If you can compare a, a Duluth, Minnesota show or wherever the hell show with Roman Reigns on on a given night and without Roman Reigns. And if there are more tickets sold for that Roman Reigns show, then yes, you have a leg to stand on. If you have that consistently happen. Um, but because w- with John Cena, it happens with Hulk Hogan back in the day. It most certainly happened. Uh, Smackdown I out selling raw right now. And who's not on Smackdown Roman Reigns. That, and this is numbers put out by the WWE. SmackDown house shows are out doing Raw house shows. What a shocker. The better show has better house show attendance. And that's what I'm saying. Roman Reigns is not on the show. I, I do. I did. did I, I think I pointed this out before, but I, I just really want to say this. How over Alexa Bliss is, is amazing to me. I just wanted to throw that out there. Heard she might be joining Raw soon. But, yeah, it's just amazing. Well, she And she's also someone who has connected with the crowd because she plays her character so well and she because she is so believable as that cheerleader bitch from high school um because she is she just is first of all she's ridiculously pretty i mean she is stupidly attractive it's like could could someone have seriously won the genetic lottery a little bit more here please um then her cosplay and that that reaches a whole different crowd. Exactly. Doing the whole Harley Quinn thing, and that was perfect timing because this was Suicide Squad being uh, coming out right around that time. It was, it was just perfect. Uh, but then, if you see interviews with her when she's not in character, she is an incredibly likable person. And she is multifaceted, and you just kind you really, the more you get to know about her, you want her to succeed and do well. Is yeah, she the- you struggled with anorexia back in the day. Uh, that's another, I mean, honestly, it actually makes her more likable to know that she is flawed in her personal life. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. And and sure, is she the best wrestler in the ring? Lord, no. But she has come a long way, and I will give her credit that that six-pack challenge was one of the best in-ring performances I think she's done to date. And, you know, that this was thinking about Mania now after the fact a week later, kind of having time to ponder it. Um, that match, considering how much they squeezed into such little time, because as we discussed last week, you know, they ran over on time. Uh, how you run over on time on a seven-hour show is just a condemnation of your poor planning. But... Those... We have to get in that music performance. If they would have scratched the music performance, mm. the rest of the show would have went fine. Yeah. But those those six women, man, they put on a hell of a match, all things considered. And I'm and 
I think that worked really well because there was no time to dick around. It was like, okay, girls, you guys have like eight minutes. Get your shit in. Yeah, uh, and, and Naomi's <laughs> finisher only works because of how well Alexa sells it. Yep. Yeah, the, that whole thing was was good. Um, but yeah, oh, okay, back to Raw. Back to Raw. But, so, but uh, what I was saying is just. Reigns was getting booed, and they kept saying he had the audience in the palm of his hands. How does someone have an audience in the palm of their hands when they were booing you and saying F you before you came out there? Right. In fact, here, let's, uh, I, I took notes. Here are some of the chants we heard during this segment. Uh, Roman sucks before he even walks out, uh, followed by, fuck you, Roman, you suck, uh, asshole, and... Um, shut the fuck up. I like that one. I love that chant. He hadn't said a word yet. And go away. Yeah, no. You do not have anyone in the palm of your hands. He literally has go away heat. To yeah. to quote Chris Traeger, literally. And yeah. I'll do the points and as it, I do that. And if he comes down to it, comes down to it, like I said, if I could get my fans with me, you really, really don't like Roman. You really, really want them to change the character. And you're one of the so many people that listen to this show. Just don't, don't. If you're in the crowd, sit on your hands. Don't cheer. Don't boo. Go to the bathroom. Good Lord, if we could start a movement where every one time Roman goes home on, the whole audience just goes to the bathroom, that would be amazing. That would be. It, it would be great if, if at some point... They would have to change his character. Yeah. So that segment was, uh, you know, all things considered, it was great. It um, was, it was as far as me, even more than my favorite moment of the week, it was the most memorable part of Raw. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then, and I really hope they, they at least make him a tweener, at the very least. Just make but him... He is- let me say this. He is not a face. If you look at how they book him, he's not a face. He's not a heel. He really doesn't do anything face. He doesn't really do anything heel. He's very much in the middle. Yeah, that's true. Then again, John Cena really doesn't act like a face. He, is... he did for a long, long time. For a long, long time, it was about hustle, loyalty and respect and he would uh, he would definitely uh, compliment his uh, opponent and he would just talk about how much he loved the WWE and he loved the universe because you they're going to either boo you or cheer you. Yeah, he used to suck up quite a bit. Yeah. He, like over the last year though, when he came back, especially when he came back to fight AJ Styles and he said, because I'm John Cena, that's why. That was very hillish. Yeah. Well, I just think about the whole thing. You know, he's all hustle, loyalty, and respect. How often would you see him run down to save someone who's getting their ass kicked? Never. But exactly. That's, that, but we've had that argument. That's why when I grew up, I I did not understand why people booed the heels and cheered the faces. Yeah, because true. Faces let their boys let their boys get the hell beat out of them. Heels never let that happen. Yeah, the heels are all much better friends. As long as they don't stab you in the back, they're better yeah. friends. <laughs> yeah. uh, so after this, we had uh, the Hardys defending the tag team championship against Gallows and Anderson. Uh, I, I got to give props to you guys. The fuck that owl chant was incredible. Yeah. Um, and this was a fun match. Uh, Hardy. It was a fun match with the Hardys coming back and then what happens later in the show. The club either needs to join up with Finn Balor or and become the club again, or they can very much get lost in the shuffle. Well, I've also heard so there there are conflicting rumors. One is that AJ's coming to Raw. The other is that the club is going to SmackDown and are going to um, hook back up with AJ. Either way, they need to be with someone else, or they're going to get lost. They yeah they need they need to change shows they really do and it would the tag team the division I think that is going to benefit the most from this shakeup I think really will be both tag team divisions because these tag team divisions desperately need to be shaken up. Raw and SmackDown tag I mean Raw's tag team division after the after Raw was deep. 
True. It is it's super deep now, but it it will be That's why they can afford to lose one or two of their teams. Yeah. Uh, next was a cruiserweight match. Uh, Neville came out. He was pontificating about how awesome he is, and Mustafa Ali came out. I th- I think they've got some plans for Mustafa Ali. I really like this guy. Yeah, and I he was in my two hundred five live. He's getting over on talent. He's not getting over on. Uh, he's not getting over based on his personality. He just goes out there and puts keeps putting in great match after great match after great match. And more people, more and more people are cheering him. Exactly. So my, uh, a couple thoughts I had on this. My first thought was when Neville got interrupted, I thought, how cool would it have been had they just pulled in, brought in Kota Ibushi for a one-night stand? And if Kota Ibushi had come out that night, people would have lost their damn minds. Uh, yeah. That would have been cool. Um, but then during the match... And I guess, come to find out later, there were these beach balls, because the crowd kept looking around and like, what the hell are they looking at? Yeah, yeah there was about seven to ten beach balls going around, and people were hidden, and the beach balls were definitely, people were ignoring the match. And Neville was pissed. Uh, and I don't know if that was, well, he knows what's going to happen on Raw. I think he was just playing up the character. Yeah, well, it, 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 whether it was character play up or he was really angry, he came off as super pissed. And and I loved the the red arrow tease. Now there's been speculation: was he going to always tease it, or was the original finish he hits the red arrow? But whatever it was, it's like he gets up on that top rope, and then finally he looks around. And the crowd's finally like, "Oh shit, he's about to do the red arrow. This is going to be great." And he looks around, he has his face on, like "fuck you guys," and jumps down, just puts him in the rings of Saturn. Uh, I thought that was beautifully done. The way and I, that. I, I will say, I never, I, I, I was all about the match. I'm not saying I'm better than anyone. I just, I thought Beach Ball Mania was stupid, and I thought they put on a really, really good match that no one paid attention to. It was a really good match, yeah. Um, and it's night after all. I even put this in the note. You just got to roll with the punches. Yeah. And, the crowd decides what the show is going to be. And I love that, uh, that Cole actually referred to it on commentary. That's how I figured out there were beach balls. Yeah. And then I loved uh, later, I don't know if you guys saw the backstage segment, um, but With Jericho, Jericho yeah. when he said beach ball mania, that was awesome. Yeah, he was actually reacting to the crowd. Yeah. When we got louder, he actually reacted to us. Yeah, so then we had uh, Vince McMahon come out. He amounts the superstar shakeup. And then the new GM and Teddy Long coming out. I thought that was pretty funny. Well, hilarious part about Vince. People hate Roman. Vince books Roman. They cheered the crap out of Vince. Well, you know, it's been, what, six months at least since we've seen Vince? Again. But you hate Roman, and the reason for Roman is Vince. Yeah, I I understand, man. I yeah, and then you get out there and he's we like we hate Roman, we hate Roman. He shrugs it off and ignores the chant. You know why? Because he's freaking Vince McMahon and he can do that. True. In that one shoulder shrug, I do not give a fuck what you think. <laughs> Which is ter- Just from a business <laughs> standpoint, is really bad to basically. But, I mean, I know he's making money. Dollar business, man. <laughs> <laughs> but at your core, these are your customers. And yes, they bought money to be there. But still, if you piss them off long enough, they will go away. He, he built the Attitude Era on telling fans, screw you. He built the Attitude Era having a... Character he, that told the fans, screw you. Well, no, he, he had a character that was a shitty boss, and then he had a character who beat the crap out of said shitty boss. And it was complete wish fulfillment for people yeah. who couldn't kick their boss in the nads. And that's what built the Attitude Era. Him being a dickhead boss and turning that into a character. Um, yeah, and, uh, yeah. And, and yeah. he was, unlike his daughter, he had no problems allowing people to get a comeuppance on him. He got his ass whooped on a regular basis. And hey, Stephanie takes her bumps. One bump a year. And it's an amazing bump every time. But she never get. I mean, just verbally, she rarely gets put down to the... It's... 
you can Seth argue... Rollins is the only one that she allowed to get the better of her in like the last year. Yeah. But I, I imagine that's going to change with Kurt Angle. True. Uh, and then, yeah, Kurt Angle shows up. Um, and he got a great reaction. The it's... only person where it's saying you suck is a compliment. <laughs> now, so... that is what I mean. Ooh, that is what, you know, they may cheer, they may boo, but they react. That whole you suck thing, it's just become a part of wrestling, saying you suck. We don't, of course, don't think Kurt Angle sucks. I mean, Ric Flair says he's the best he's ever seen. So, talent yeah. rules all over everything. And I, I, I truly believe that about Roman Reigns. If if they let him spread his wings and really show what he can do in the ring as far as a versatile performer, people would, you know, they would get behind him. It's that how many Superman punches did he throw in the Undertaker match? Oh, how many spears did he do in the Undertaker match? He's boring. He's vanilla. Yeah, that was that was one of the mo- that was one of the worst things. That would have been a perfect moment to bust out some new move. Now, yes. granted, to be fair, it's, the Undertaker can't do much. He cannot take many bumps. So you do not want to you know break out some new variation of a super duper power bomb. Or something, you know, from a fireman's carry or whatever on this poor dude. Uh, But it just was like, I kept thinking, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different response. Uh, So, yeah, it was, that was, but anywho, now to one of the quite possibly best, best moment of the entire, entire WrestleMania week. Oh, Oh, how I love this. And the open challenge from the New Day, which we thought they should have done as champions, but the open challenge from the New Day, and they said it's the Raw after WrestleMania, you know. The, who who wants to come get some of this? And quite possibly my favorite music, my boys, our boys, our favorite tag team, and it's not even, honestly, not even close. Oh yeah, it, Nash Dawson, the revival show. Oh, that was so, so cool, and that place erupted. And I loved the singing along with the music. Um, and I love you. You probably didn't hear the commentary. Corey Graves lost his mind. He was screaming yes, yes, a thousand times yes. Uh, I love Corey Graves. He is he is so incredible on commentary he is and it's been fun watching him over the last few years uh when he started on commentary till now seeing how he's grown and he's just so comfortable in that role now and he is so good uh but yeah the revival came out uh soundly beat the new day and then tore up kofi oh so good yeah and it was funny because during the match you can tell that Everybody loves, I mean, a lot of people do love the rival, but you can tell the casual fan does not get why they're so good. Yeah. And we talked to our friend Steve Long, and he asked, well, you know, why it's so good? And I'm just like, to understand the revival, you can't be a fan of sports entertainment. You have to be a fan of pro wrestling. Yeah, in fact, he Steve went with me to a concert last night. When driving to Tulsa, we spent most of the entire way talking about wrestling. And he had mentioned that, you know, he was like, I don't get the revival. And I, you had suggested to him, go back and rewatch those matches with DIY, because he loves DIY. And so uh, he went back and he watched the TakeOver Toronto match. And I remember he texted me that night. He watched it. He was like, oh, my God. It was like he got it. He watched this match. And he's like, I remember watching this before. But the first time I watched it, I was really just paying attention to Johnny Gargano. And then he watched it watching everybody. And he was like, oh, holy crap. These guys are amazing. And it was the revival. And I told him, I was like, now you need to go back and watch those matches with American Alpha. uh, Because those are also really good. Yeah. Because America Alpha, I have realized, is kind of boring. They're kind of boring. The revival made them great. American Alpha needs better opponents. They need yeah, to not they be... Really do. They need, 
Yeah, because I was like the American Alpha and the Usos match. They are too young and too talented to get into this routine of doing that same tap in, he hits the shoulders in the mat, and then hit the shoulders in the corner and go straight into uh, Grand Amplitude. They're, uh, they're too good. They're too young. They're too talented to get into that so quickly. They need to really put on tag match. Exactly, and that, that's the that's been one of the downfalls of this brand split is you have so few tag teams, and you end up putting two of your best tag teams in a division with essentially three other teams of jobbers, and you wonder why it gets boring after a while. Well, uh, you know, I always say jobbers are only jobbers because you make them that way. With Ascension, there's no reason for them to be jobbers. We They've made them jobbers. Right. It was so over. And I think their characters, if they stuck with the characters they were in NXT, they would be over now. Fandango, uh, uh, Brazongo, super talented guy, super in wing work. Give them time to work, and they're going to gr- get a fan base. It's just that the tag matches somehow on SmackDown have started getting women's wrestling. Uh, times, you know, what women's wrestling used to get. They only get like five minutes. One yeah. time in a Brazongo and American Alpha match, American Alpha just basically came in, did their finisher, and walked away. Yeah, and that does no one any favors. No does one at all. no one for any favors. So, hmm. that's what I'm saying. It's They have made the division that way. When they have first announced the division, everybody was even. The Usos were on a downturn. American Alphas had just debuted. Most of the tag teams were even. So you you had this chance where you could have kept them even. Every tag match could have been this long, like, the tag division is so even. But no, they just made the American Alphas the dominant tag team. Yeah, and then they dropped the ball with the whole Bray Wyatt, Randy Orton team. That team should have held onto those belts for a lot longer. Because that... It should have happened at SummerSlam. It shouldn't have happened at WrestleMania, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think as much as people are annoyed about it, it should have been AJ and maybe it should have been uh, AJ and maybe Baron Corbin or somebody for the world title at at Mania. As Hell, to, maybe it should have been that the AJ Cena match. The, yeah, the Royal yeah. Rumble match that should have been a mania that should have been the mania main event. Yes, yeah. uh, and that because that is that's that's special. That's Hogan meets Flair special. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I, now I know they're trying to build up the big four. They're trying to make them almost like WrestleMania. So having super big matches at those shows are understandable. But it really, in retrospect, looking back, it had that match, especially as great as that match was, been at Mania, um, it would have, people would have just, you know, pooped their pants. They would have loved it so much. It would have been so incredible. Um, okay, let's get through the rest of Raw, because there was still some other stuff that happened. There was a uh, six-woman tag match. Um, that really is was pretty damn forgettable. Uh, Bailey, Dana Brooke, and Sasha Banks against uh, the returning Emma, Nia Jax, and Charlotte. Uh, I loved Emma's entrance. Her getting on the um, the announce table, I thought was great. Uh, I, I liked her. Her the whole dynamic with her and Dana didn't make a ton of sense to me because I'm like they were friends when she left. I don't yeah. understand. Um. Because F continuity is what we said. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's like an X Men film continuity, <laughs> schmontinuity. Uh, but is Sasha ta- Sasha tapped out Charlotte. Do we really need to see these ladies fight anymore? Um, Naya beat up Charlotte. That was awesome. That was, that was. Um, my boo, Naya ba- Naya Dax. It's my yeah. boo. Yeah, she's uh-huh. awesome. Um, we then had a, a <laughs> Kurt Angle, Sami Zayn backstage segment. Um, with G- the Jinder Mahal, what is Jinder Mahal on? That man looks like his muscles are about to pop out of his body. Uh, he yeah, he actually addressed it on social media because there have been rumors that he does steroids. But if you follow Jinder Mahal on social media, 
he has completely changed his diet and how much he works out. He No one outworks him. No one out does his nutrition. That's what he said in his speech. But I would have said that before he even said that. Just as a person that has followed Jinder Mahal a long time, he he does the sensible portions. He works out. I'm not saying he's not on steroids. I don't know the guy. But I'm just saying, if if he as much as he posts about working out, if he's actually doing that, that's why he looks the way he does. Yeah, I mean, he, he looks and... I think I I don't know if he just realized okay I'm gonna have to do something to stand out or it's three man band part two is heading my way real fast. Three man band. He actually liked three man band. Really? <laughs> when I was I met I got actually was in line to see him twice. I was like now it's Drew back now that Drew's back can we get a three man band reunion? And he's like dude I would love that. He's like that was my favorite thing I've done in wrestling. I can definitely see that being something that, that those three guys probably enjoyed, but they were buried so bad. And that horrible feud that they had with, uh, with them and Hornswoggle against uh, the El Matadors and Tor- El Torito. Yeah, I just I don't want Ginger playing. I, I hate that he has to play. I've met the guys uh, a few times now, and it's just that whole wearing the turban on your head, generic Indian character is not who he is and I think that comes across it's yeah. not who he is Sadly. I mean why can't you just book the dude as a good wrestler that's true and I mean I hate that the Indian I mean Mustafa Ali is stepping out of that right now or he's not playing the generic Indian character why does Jinder Mahal have to play it well I think why? Mustafa Ali is actually Arab um, but well, still, thing, but not, he's not. If you come from that part of the world, you generally play a, a generic character. You know what I'm saying? I think Mustafa, so. Mustafa Ali is getting pushed as just a really good cruiserweight wrestler. Part of what part of the thing that helps Mustafa Ali is the fact that he is a cruiserweight, and Vince get, does not care about the cruiserweights. Yeah. Um, also, the fact is uh, Mustafa Ali is actually a really good looking guy Jinder Mahal not so much see and that's I I got uh, from being in the line I got a different tone there was a lot of women in the line because of the way Jinder Mahal looks interesting okay well there you go just people with a certain set but a lot of people are and the physique I mean somebody uh, Corey calls him hard body Mahal they should press that so much more yeah. Someone that has that physique, you don't have to worry about the fact that he happens to be what his race happens to be. That's a big thing with me as far as wrestlers. You don't have to play to your race. Good call. Well, uh, one thing I, I think with this segment is, and something Vince alluded to earlier in the show, is that Stephanie's going to be away for a while, which is is great. As good as Stephanie is, she overstays her welcome very quickly and and so often it becomes more about her than getting other people over. Or if that's not the intention, that's the way it comes off. So having Kurt Angle really be the person to run the show will be a good thing. But I, I love how you can already tell he's going to do things very differently than both Stephanie and, um, and uh, Mick Foley did it. Uh, and the the segment with Sami Zayn was perfect. And I don't like the Sami Zayn being made to look like a dork, but whatever. I do. I would not be surprised if Sami Zayn got moved to SmackDown, which I think would be a much better place for him anyway. Uh, what do you? So we'll talk about the the shakeup here in a little bit. Um, so we'll we'll just we'll we'll skip over that for now. Okay. Uh, Brock Lesnar, Paul Heyman. Uh, I uh, loved the We Want Paul. Balor chance. I was going to say, uh, great promo. I truly thought Brock was going to, based on his schedule that I knew about, it, I thought Brock was going to lose his belt that night, uh, but just based on the schedule. And then I found out, you know, through the rumor mills, being at WrestleMania, you know, that he, on his last year of his contract, he has a lot more dates. So he can actually stay champion and make appearances. Well, good. I mean, it's 
I didn't hate his last run. I really wish he had been at more pay-per-views. It shouldn't have been a case where... Because literally, his last run, he he faced three people. He he you know he beat Cena. He gave Cena a couple of rematches. One of those rematches included Seth Rollins, and he had a match with Roman Reigns, which Seth Rollins then became part of. And that was an over six month long reign. That's ridiculous. That I keep, I keep hearing rumors that they. I mean, not even a rumor. I I, I assume it's a fact. That the main event we're going to get next year is Brock and Roman. Oh, sweet. I just hope it's not Brock keeping the title for a year and then losing to Roman. Yeah, because because a way certainly to get Roman more over will be to do that. I would rather, you know, honestly, I would next year, especially if they move AJ to Raw, <laughs> I would rather see AJ and Brock because you know people are going to be like, well, AJ is so much smaller. Well, CM yeah. Punk took took Brock to the limit. And that is him. why you're never going to get AJ and Brock in, in in events world. I mean, the they he had the Brock destroy the whole New Day at one point when they were tag team champions. Yeah. All the, but it, I mean, gonna, you, there, as much as we want to see it, I don't think he's going to have a smaller guy beat Brock. Brock is saved. He is the appetite. He is the main dish for Roman Reigns in New Orleans. That's just such a waste. Um, unless they, it, well, I say that if they do if they do Roman better for the next year, they turn him heel, they let him be a dick, let him change, get new gear, express himself, let him get over naturally. My whole, my whole thing, and I think it would work amazingly is if Paul Heyman turns on Brock Lesnar and joins Roman Reigns. That would be, you know, and because he has spoken very highly of yeah. Roman. Yeah, and, and you know, when he's like, after I saw Roman Reigns completely decimate The Undertaker, and, and, and I saw that he's the new guy in this yard. It, and he's like, his parents, his grandparents, they were all Paul Heyman guys. Yeah, they, yep. I, I like that. Like I mean, I and the person that can make a cheering crowd boo and a booing child, a crowd cheer is Paul Heyman. He can, that is a person that has a crowd in the palm of his hands. That is true. That is very true. So uh, one thing, one real quick on the the whole AJ thing. If if this ever did happen, you know, you could have uh, you could have Paul cutting a promo about you know. He's conquered everywhere. He conquered Japan. AJ comes out and says, yeah, you know who else conquered Japan? I did. You know who did it more than you did? Me. And, and, and my whole thing is this. They do it that way. Put AJ with the club and just beat the crap out of Brock Lesnar as much as possible before they finally have their one-on-one match. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be the way to do it. Uh, and then Brock Lesnar like comes into the match with tape ribs, and and maybe in that case Vince McMahon could see, you know, hey, you can make this an actual even match because Brock Lesnar has tape ribs or whatever. I don't know because I just know that Finn or AJ going over Rock may be a cold day in hell. Yeah, so cold, for Brock in Vince's eyes is our Andre the Giant. You're not going to see him lose very much. You're not going to see him take a clean pin very much. You've only seen it happen once. One time. The clean pin. I'm talking the clean pin. Was that to Triple that H? Goldberg. Oh, you're right. You're right. That's it. Everybody else has had their cheat, hits, hit him with something, whatever. He has only taken a clean, just straight man-on-man victory one time. And that was with Goldberg. The person that may be the only other person that maybe eclipsed Brock Lesnar's mystique. So, there you go. you're not going to see Finn or AJ pin Brock, and you can let that go. <laughs> yeah, I can see that in Vince's eyes. Um, <laughs> but one guy who you could see possibly in Vince's eyes pinning Brock Lesnar, Braun Strowman, who came out. Definitely. 
Definitely. And I, if they do this feud, if they actually do this feud, they have to push Braun as being much stronger than Brock. I mean, he does kind of tower over Brock. He does tower over Brock. He can outlift Brock. He is actually much, much stronger. He is a six foot eight, three hundred and fifty pound power lifter. <laughs> so he is stronger than Brock. It's just Brock would have to sell during that match. Yeah. And I mean, it's one of those few times that they could get Braun and Brock over at the same time. Absolutely that and that because that was a good reaction when the, their stare down until Braun you know was like no I'll fight you when I want to fight you because the crowd you guys were going nuts for that that was that was very cool. Um, speaking of the crowd going nuts, uh, Sheamus and Cesaro uh, quite possibly more over than Cass and Enzo. Yes, ah, I get to bring it, I, I get some insider information for you. Yes, tell us the chant. Uh, da da, you know, da 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 da, da Seamus and Cesaro. Yeah, that chant. It was started by a member of our club, Matt Haslam Hammond. Oh, thank you, Matt. He started that chant, and you know how some people can, you know, you can just say, "Oh, yeah, I did that." No, him and the five guys, they start a lot of the chants that go on in our crowd because there was like six of them, and they could just all go together. And, I mean, confirmed by other people that the red-headed guy in this section started to chant. So Matt Haslam, shout out to him, and great way to start that chant that will probably be going the whole year. It, It is incredible how these two guys have gotten this team over that shouldn't have worked. This team of... A guy that no one cared about, that people wanted literally. This guy had go away heat, the the X Pac leave me the fuck alone heat, and you put him with a guy who everyone for the fans, generally speaking, adore, but also realize Vince is never going to do anything with this guy. They put them together as this tag team, and it shouldn't work, and it does, and so yeah, I, it's a. Uh, it was that was so much fun, and and they the two of them played off the crowd yeah, so um, beautifully. And WrestleMania is definitely a European crowd, so you have two Europeans, <laughs> and Cesaro. I mean, Sheamus. The thing about what Sheamus is, he was a very boring wrestler. Sheamus now is Roman Reigns. What Roman Reigns was in the Shield. If you remember what Roman Reigns was in the Shield, he was so over because. Dean and Seth would do all the working and then he would just come in and do his moves and that would pop. You actually have that with Sheamus and Cesaro. Cesaro does most of the working. Sheamus hits his bro kick, his few moves. Everybody pops for that. Sheamus is over. Yeah, so we, I'm guessing at payback we're going to get Sheamus and Cesaro taking on the Hardys. I'm hoping... Yeah, well, yeah, they, they, I mean, they won the match, and, dude, the tearaway kilts with the suit jackets, so awesome. Oh, that is so cool. <laughs> that is, and and I love the the way they do the the thing when, you know, Cesaro comes out, and, he's, and he ends up standing, and then Sheamus is, they're back-to-back. I think that whole thing is so cool. I mean, they have really done a tremendous job of gelling as a team, and and yeah, and working together, and it's so so great. It would, and there's a part of me that lo- would love to think that someday this could turn into a Cesaro World Title run. I know that's never going to happen, sadly. Uh, but man, it's Xavier so Woods once pointed out. He's like the tag team titles are a world championship too, and he that says in wrestling, I've been a world champion. He says that all the time. Yep. Uh, so, yes. uh, this was super fun, and then I'm sure your favorite match of the night, Jinder Mahal versus Sami Zayn, Sami got a hell of a reaction. I didn't even put that on my notes, because it was <laughs> over so quickly. Um, uh, they showed Jinder Mahal no respect. I actually like the guy. I mean, as far as a wrestler, I like him as a wrestler. 
I think they could do more with him. I feel the same way about Carter Hawkins on SmackDown. It's just, it's a waste of talent. Uh, maybe he gets traded to SmackDown, but I don't know. I mean, not everyone can go to SmackDown because then at SmackDown, I have so much talent, no one gets on TV. True. So, we, you have to kind of, and there's, you, you have know, to ho- hope that he comes up with something that they can do. But there's also, in a way, there's nothing wrong with being that gatekeeper role. And maybe that's what he and Kurt Hawkins are going to end up just being, is they're going to be the gatekeepers. They're the guys you go through to get over. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, I mean, you know, CJ Parker was that for a long time in NXT, and he got a lot of people over. And now he is doing gangbusters in Japan. Because uh, he thought he was more than that, that gatekeeper guy. Right. I mean, I guess it's better to be employed than not employed. You know, you know your checks are coming in. Unlike, uh, you know, uh, unlike, you know, some companies you work for, you know your checks are coming in. True. So, well, and I think you look at you look at guys like Hawkins and, and Mahal, and they're at a very different point in their career. They're a lot older. And they, you know, they were in WWE. They left. They had to do the hustle out somewhere else. Um, you know, CJ Parker or Juice Robinson, as he goes by now, he's a young dude. He's a very young guy. And he's at that point in his career where it's definitely in, in life, he can go around and hustle. Plus, he got a job in New Japan. That's a steady paycheck. So He got a job in New Japan as a young boy, which is, it was definitely a step back. You yeah. know, it was awesome for him that he was willing to bet on himself. Exactly. Uh, and then we had the uh, final uh, match of the night, uh, Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe taking on Seth Rollins and a mystery partner who happened to be Finn Balor. And, oh, my God, what a reaction. Now, I, I am going to ask you, when we talk about SmackDown, I'm going to want your comparison of this reaction versus someone else's. Uh, no, I would say... Uh, yeah, I will definitely give you my comparison. Okay. Um, I admit, I did not actually see the end of this match, so I don't know what happens. Uh, uh, I was going to say, Balor went over a double stomp on KO. I mean, nothing, I mean, the match was very much the secondary part of this. It was all about, it was all about, uh, it was all about Finn coming back. And I like that he played off that he didn't trust Seth Rollins during the match. Like, he kept looking go kind of over his shoulder at Seth because, of course, Seth is the run that were, uh, the one that injured him. And, of course, Finn Balor likes this thing called continuity. Like, why would I come out and be the tag team partner of the guy that hurt me? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so Finn Balor is not your uh, normal, hey, you know, screw all this. He's going to be like, he's going to try to make the story work. So it was a good. It was it, I honestly didn't pay attention to the match. I'll be real. I was in the crowd. I knew Finn was going all over. I love KO. Don't get me wrong, but it was just like it was a throwaway tag team match to boost Finn getting over. There was nothing going to be shocking about the end of that match. So as far as your Raw after Manias, how does this one rank in the ones that you've seen? Honestly, of the ones I've been to, I um. I give it a, out of the four I've been to. It's three out of the four. Okay, so uh, nowhere near the best. New Orleans, New Orleans was actually, even though it was fun, I would actually rate it the last because absolutely nothing happened on the show. It was really just a recap of the show. It was a lot of rematches. Nothing happened on the show, and then Daniel Bryan came out and did the yes thing. Uh, Thirty-one was my favorite one because that's when Brock came and destroyed everything. And you know, beat up Michael Cole. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, and it was just it was just such a monumental moment. Uh that was awesome. And then uh thirty two in Dallas, you had Enzo and Cass come out, the return of Cesaro, AJ Styles wins the Fatal Four Way. A lot happened that night. Oh, and that so, fatal four way was great too. Yeah, it was. It was a great fatal four way. So this was three out of four as far as my four that I've been to. So then we have our first SmackDown Live uh, after Mania. We have to address what happened after the show on Raw. Oh, oh, I what happened? I didn't know. Oh, Goldberg came out. Really? 
said his goodbye. Oh wow! Why he, wouldn't they he, put that on TV? It was on the network. Of Son course, of a yeah. bitch. It was on the network, so you had to switch over to the network for Raw Talk, and the first twelve minutes of Raw Talk was Goldberg basically saying goodbye. And did I lose you? No, I'm still. Here. So the res- settings on my uh, apparently set a uh, reset after an update last week. Go. Oh. So I mean, like everything was set to fifteen minutes. I hate it when that happens. Uh, so I'm like sitting there talking, and I was like, "Did I lose you?" Because my screen went black, and I was trying to get my screen to come back, and it just went. It just died. Oh, oh well, that's okay. Stuff happens. So uh, Goldberg came back. Yes, Goldberg came back, and he basically said, "You know what? He hasn't got it. He got his ass kicked last night. It hadn't happened a whole lot in his career, which is an understatement." And basically, he said, "You'll never, you know, win or who." It basically, he's gonna walk away. And the only reason he came back was so his kid could see him wrestle. The only reason he was basically talking about he was eating eight times a day. Working out three times a day, and he was, you know, just talking about how basically miserable he was because trying to come back and be somewhat of what he was. He he said he was doing that, and he still was twenty pounds less than he was in his prime. Well, I mean that make I mean he, the, that makes sense because you know you're 50, he, you're not yeah, sure. but man, he looked great, and yeah, he was fifty years old, and he but he still had that vibe of. Are you, did you look at me wrong? I will kill you. He there was just a different vibe with that guy. So yeah, I am. If the Goldberg era is over, I am very happy. Uh, I got my WrestleMania 32 chair, and I know he does the uh, signings. Hopefully, one day I can have the Undertaker, Goldberg, and the Big Show all sign that chair, so we can say because you know we say goodbye to all of them. And, I mean, honestly, The Undertaker was the consistent phenom. Goldberg was the explosive phenom. And Big Show was, most people don't realize how explosive of a phenom he was. Because he won the world title, the WCW World Championship, on his first night with a victory over Hulk Hogan. Neither Undertaker or Goldberg can say that. Yep, you're right. I remember he won it was maybe his second time when he won it when uh, he beat Ric Flair and Flair put him in a figure four and he just totally no sold it and he just he you know grabbed Flair by the throat and just stood up and yeah. choke slammed him and uh, and that was he held on to the belt until the NWO ganged up on him and and Hogan took it. Uh, yeah, so you look at three guys that were ph- phenoms in the business. I mean, uh, the, the giant, he will tell you how green he was. He trained, started training six months before, and Hogan said, we're putting the belt on you. And who does Hogan put over? No one. Yeah, very, very rarely. So, wow. So, uh, man, that I, I will have to go back to the network and check that out. Yeah, it's the Raw after uh, the Raw talk. The Raw, the Raw talk. talk after WrestleMania. Uh, the first like twelve minutes was dedicated to Goldberg, and I mean, you know what? I might not like Goldberg as a wrestler. I may never like Goldberg as a wrestler, even though, oh my God, I was a part of that uh, group when he first started. I was all about Goldberg on his streak because he just looked like such a badass. But uh, but the dude as a guy and as a father, you know what I'm saying? Uh. You know, you can't. It doesn't seem like you can get much better than that. Um, I'm not a like I said. I don't really equate that in whether I root for you or not. I never equate it whether you're a good person or not. You know, whether I root for you as a wrestler because just like on their side, wrestling is a business. For me, wrestling is entertainment. So I don't care who you are personally. Just entertain me. There you go. 
<laughs> so, a- any other thoughts on Raw before we move over to the SmackDown? That was it. I, I did, yeah, I just wanted to say because it, it was such a moment. Raw had just ended, and I was actually walking out, and then Goldberg's music started, and I came back and sat in my seat. Not a lot of wrestlers would commend that respect from me. There you go. So uh, SmackDown Live, the first SmackDown after Raw, where they actually tried to make it a thing, and I think the crowd... Um, was still pretty pretty amped up. You could definitely tell on TV that there were people who were tired, it, it, and but it was still. It, granted, two things happened that woke that place up like crazy. And, and I'm gonna say the opening of the show. No one wanted Orton to beat Bray Wyatt. Yeah, that yeah. was a, that was the big thing. Is how you start the show is on these shows are such a big thing. You have to get the show. You got to get the people into it from the beginning. And then they'll, it'll ride, it'll ride the wave all night. Um, One thing I thought was interesting about this is at Mania, Randy Orton really looked like he didn't care and wasn't trying very hard, but he actually, in this promo looked like he was trying. Uh, It was Randy Orton is so weird. You either get Randy Orton giving no fucks or, or Randy Orton giving 110%. There I, is no middle ground with him. I don't know what time that they had, but they clearly cut their time, and that probably pissed him off. Yeah, and he will let you know if he's mad. Yeah, and Randy <laughs> does not do good. From what I've seen in the past, and rumors I've read, Randy does not do good when you change something at the last minute on him. It pisses him off. Can you imagine, so Randy Orton, I think wrestling fans would agree, is an excellent pro wrestler. Do you think he's the kind of guy who could survive in another promotion or, you know, even thrive? Because he has had the silver spoon of WWE in his mouth his entire career. Um, Say if something happened and say he was cut or he quit or whatever, could you see him showing up in, say, a New Japan and being able to hack it? And yes, just because of his name. they would. I mean, his name in Japan, he is an international star. They would kiss his ass way more than the WWE would. For a while. But then how many of the wrestlers do I mean, you think I mean, would... I, I'm just saying, he's been on the top of WWE for a long time. So does he need the money? No. Not even a little bit. But so, I, I so he's like, how long? They would just treat him like an attraction. They'd only yeah. bring him in three, four times a year. He'd get over or not get over. That's the whole thing. The Japan working schedule in in, in general is a lot less than the American working schedule. TNA would give him stock options to come over to them. He, yeah. I think he's one of the... There's only like five people in professional wrestling, but he would be able. He would have the creative control over his character if he went to Impact. He wouldn't have to lose if he didn't feel like losing. He he's one of the few people that could really move the needle for Impact just by showing up. Yeah, but he couldn't use name because WWE owns his name for wrestling. Isn't that his legal name? Yes, they still own it. John Cena. John Cena put it in an interview. Said. If I go wrestle somewhere else, I can't wrestle as John Cena. That's ridiculous. That's your freaking legal name. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome, right? No, that's really screwed up. Um, um, they, no, I'm just saying, I mean, just think of how you had to write that contract to get around the actual law of not being able to use your own real name when wrestling. Good Lord, I'm just like, I'm in awe of how good the lawyer had to be. I don't even know if it's true. It probably wouldn't hold up in court. If John Cena or Randy Orton really wanted to go wrestle somewhere else, they could probably wrestle under their name. Come on, let's just be honest. But to make you think that, to have that legal paperwork basically say that, that's ingenious. It's like evil genius level. And Because that's the difference with, say, Cody Rhodes, is Rhodes is not his legal last name. Yeah. So he can't sit back and go, that's my legal name. Um, he could wrestle I, as Cody Runnels. Yes. Um, I would have probably, and that's why Brandy Rhodes, because she was never referred to as Brandy Rose, 
she was never uh, referred to as Brandy Rhodes in the WWE. That's why she can use the name. Right. That is why they try to get around it by saying coming towards the ring is Cody and Brandy Rhodes. Right. Or they just call him Cody, but then they will refer to the Rhodes family legacy. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I, the thing I think about when I think about so what would happen to someone like a Randy Orton or John Cena showed up uh, specifically in New Japan. I could see one of those guys in the ring just going, okay, who do these guys think they are? And halfway shooting on them and really hurting them. Because I have no doubt in my mind that if they got in the ring with someone like a Shibata or that the bald dude who is short and stocky and looks terrifying, whose name I can't remember right now, um, who was the never weight open weight champion for a long time, but who is legitimately scary as fuck. And he's he's one of those guys that I, I could see in the ring with Brock Lesnar and going, I don't know who's going to win this if this turns into a shoot. Um, I could see one of those dudes just going, oh, okay, so, you know, really smacking the fuck out of them and saying, welcome to Japan. Um, and that's what I think. I think, yeah, the, the red carpet would be there. The checks would be huge. They would get better treatment than other people. And they're big stars, so they're going to bring in, bring in big money. I have no problems with that. But I could see the other wrestlers being really hard on them. And I, I mean, I could see it, but the one thing Japan is known about is how professional that they are. True. How much, how much they are about the business and taking care of the business. I don't think, honestly, me personally, don't. I mean, it would be cool if it was to see John Cena just get the crap slapped out of him. But for the most part, I just think it would be business as usual. They would yeah. recognize that they can make money. Well, in this segment, Bray Wyatt eventually came out, and then Eric Rowan came out with a new sheep mask, uh, and then Luke Harper came out, uh, babyface Luke Harper, and I like that he didn't rejoin the Wyatts. Um, I'm, I really hope they do something with Luke, uh, give him an actual push. I know I, I shouldn't think that they will, but, um, but once that stuff kind of happened, the segment woke up, uh, but otherwise it was pretty blah. Blah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you had Miz and Maurice backstage. Uh, yeah. Do I say it again? Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Randy got like zero, if not a negative reaction. It was. It was like no one wants you to be champion. Uh, Bray, uh, AJ. I mean, you could go through a list of people they'd rather have champion as Randy Orton. And then that the match was such shit at WrestleMania. I think they were holding that against them also. Yeah. So hopefully he will not hold the belt very long. Um, the next match was Naomi and Alexa Bliss for the Women's Championship. I thought this was actually a pretty good little match. Um, I thought both ladies were really over. Uh, and it made up for their world title match when Naomi won the title. That was just so botched. And you can see they went away from the split-legged moonsault because... For some reason, Alexa couldn't get herself in the right position to take it, so they went with the submission, and how they got to the submission finisher after, like, a pin attempt and then went into the submission was pretty impressive. That was cool. That kind of roll around twisty, and then all of a sudden she's got her all tied up. Uh, I like that. Uh, then we had one of the... Uh, no. Do you, I... you mentioned the bitch, but Miz backstage, he's so over... God, they can face turn him anytime they want to. Yeah, he's he's incredible. Uh, we'll talk more about him later. Um, so then we had the first real moment when I think you guys really woke up. Uh, Kurt Hawkins in the ring doing an open challenge. And at first I was like, Nakamura, Nakamura. Until he said, I give you to the count of ten. And then when Ty Dillinger's music hit and that place blew up. It was so funny because cool. when they did it, as soon as he came out and said he was doing an open title and challenge, I started putting up ten. I knew it was Ty. I knew it was Ty. I like. I knew it was Ty. Like everything in me knew it was Ty. And I think SmackDown is the is the best place for Ty Dillinger. Um, the only thing I think uh, AJ is going to have to stop using his version of the tiebreaker. That's going to still be Ty's finisher. Um, cause AJ busts that out from time to time and they might tell or ask him, Hey, can you not use this? So this guy can actually use his finishing move. 
I could I could see that being happening, but who cares? It's not like AJ doesn't have eight thousand other moves. People uh, went crazy for this match. <laughs> this match was fun too. Um, yeah, crazy. And like every time there was any type of count, and every time he did any move, ten, ten, my hands actually started cramping up from doing the ten things so much. Now, I don't know, could you guys tell from there in the audience, um, Ty looked like he had a lot of tanner on. Like, he was kind of orange. Yeah, he did. And you know, it's your first night on the big show. You can make a mistake, and I imagine he'll fix that going in. Yeah. Uh, Fix that going in the next week. Yeah, so that was fantastic. Um, That was followed by something that I thought sucked with Mojo Rawley's backstage interview. Uh, did that come off as ho- as horrible to you guys there? We didn't did? see it. Oh, you didn't? No. Uh, feel fortunate. It sucked. Bad. Uh, but then it was followed up by something glorious. Uh, the whole... Uh, John Cena's music hit. So did you guys think it was actually Cena when his music hit? No, we had already heard that uh, him and Nikki were going to be gone for a while. Okay. Because it seemed like at first it was... It was actually Cena, and when he when Miz first ran out, I was like, oh, "Okay, it's Cena." Then when you got a closer look at him, you're like, "Oh my God, that's the Miz," and the Miz does the best John Cena impersonation, and uh, Maurice does a great Nikki Bell impersonation. I I thought this was fantastic, um, and uh, and then the violin player came out. You're what? The violin player, the uh, the guy playing the violin for Nakamura. Did you could you guys see him when he came out? Yeah, we saw him before he, we saw him before he came out and if you will notice if you see my uh on the club if you see my video of it uh I had already started recording before they actually announced Nakamura and nice. And I I knew what was coming. And that's the guy who played um at, at least one takeover. If I'm Yeah, Lee, Lee Jordan. Um He's the guy. He is uh, kind of a hip-hop violinist or something like that. He's actually with the Jordan brand, to believe it or not. Uh, yeah, so you know when he comes out, you know who's coming out right behind him. And it was a great... I mean, that reaction, I it was much bigger, much bigger than Balor's. I put it on the level of Roman Reigns. I wouldn't say it was right there, but... Everybody singing, doing the, the, you know, the song, and yeah, people went crazy. And I someone cried. I think I saw someone cry. Would that someone be you? No, no. You know, you know, <laughs> I'm not a big Nakamura guy. Man, well, and then, then the, the have you seen the the footage of the crowd leaving afterwards doing the song? No. Oh my God. Okay, so there's this video of people walking it looks like under some underpass or something as they're leaving the stadium singing in mass that was them walking back to the hotels yeah yeah that was so cool uh (laughs) yeah if by by next year wrestlemania time if nakamura is not the wwe champion wwe has lost their minds um because at this point if if they don't look at this and because you know he's already selling a shit ton of merch, um, if, if Vince isn't looking at this and seeing dollar signs, he is crazy. Because uh, this guy is so over, and he, all he has to do is walk around, make funny faces and strange hand gestures, and then fall on his back. Yeah, <laughs> and the, I, people, believe me, I was cheering for him. I was cheering because it was kind of a cool moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't get him. I don't. I don't get him. I don't understand why people love him so much. He's like your favorite wrestler's favorite wrestler. I mean, Sasha uh, Sasha Banks gushes over Nakamura. She's like, I, I want to go to SmackDown because that's where Nakamura is. And it's just, I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. But I will never understand it. So... I just, I just, it's one of those. I just tip my hat to it, but and, and no one that's a Nakamura fan can explain it to me either. He just has, he has it. He has that, 
That and that's what I don't get. I don't think he has it. He's just like, it's an old Asian guy coming out looking weird. He has the spark of charisma that if if Roman Reigns had even a tenth of that charisma spark that Nakamura has, he would be the superstar Vince McMahon wants him to be and is desperately trying to make him be. Uh, but Nakamura just has this in, in, you know, intangible thing about him that commands a crowd and a room. And, and you know, you were there. It, it was, uh, man. Yeah, like I said, I'm sitting there watching it, turning my head like, I don't understand this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't get this. I'm like I have. I feel like I watch wrestling on a different level than other people, and try to see what things psychologically connect to people, and I don't get it. It is like when they say scientists try to figure out traffic, and no one can come up for a reason that traffic happens. I don't understand Nakamura. Oh, well, there you go. There you I go. I don't. And it's not that I'm not a fan. It's not that I hate watching him wrestle. I think he's a great worker. Him and Bobby Roode's matches were very old school wrestling. I loved it. I love it. Don't get me wrong. I just I don't get why he's so it. I don't I don't see the it that is him. Well, there you go. Hopefully at some but, point oh, you will. I, I can add after he came out and they probably didn't show that. Did they show Dolph Ziggler coming out? No, wasn't that after the show? No, Dolph Ziggler came out on commercial, I'm guessing, and challenged Nakamura to the main event of the evening. So we thought it was going to be the SmackDown main event, but it was actually the main event of the evening. So I'm guessing that was a way to keep people around for 205 Live. I don't know if you watched 205 Live. That shit definitely worked. Okay, yeah, I actually did not watch 205 Live. I need to. Uh, I'm thinking, yeah, let me just say this. It was sold out. I think it was 17,000 people. I think about 2,000 left. That's a bit it. So that was definitely 205 Live's biggest crowd. Nice. Well, that was smart to do. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in hearing about the uh, the Dolph match here in a little bit. Um, but then, then, so let's get through the rest of this show. Baron Corbin and Dean Ambrose had a street fight that I swear to God at the beginning of the show they said was for the IC title, but obviously wasn't. I just didn't understand the point other than Corbin just wanting to be able to go, I beat you. And uh, Dean, apparently this is his specialty match that he never wins. Yeah. Well, he won that Ambrose Asylum match against uh, Jericho when he put him through all those tacks. Okay. But that's not a street fight yet because he lost the street fight to Brock. Yeah. Uh, But this match was much better than the one he had with Brock. Yeah, your street, uh, your uh, record in your specialty match is not very good, no. but it was a very good match. The BC ends it with the end of days, and that was a good, good win. Keeps Baron Corbin relevant without giving him the belt, and it keeps the feud going. Yeah, so that was too. Uh, so then we had Shane McMahon came out and talked about the superstar shakeup. AJ came out. AJ was super over. Uh, as always, um, I like that he was, he said, I don't want to go anywhere, which makes me wonder. And, and apparently, I guess Vince McMahon keeps changing his mind. Uh, shocker, I know. But I really hope they don't move him. He's so... I hope, I hope they do, because I, I want AJ and Nakamura to WrestleMania. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't see them being on the show and them not doing something with it. Yeah... I mean, yeah, but... And AJ I, and Nakamura for the WWE title at WrestleMania? Oh, my God. Yes, I want that. Believe me. In fact, here's... you know, And how you could do it is he gets moved over to Raw. Uh-huh. Uh, he wins the Royal Rumble. In between, you know, now and then, Nakamura gets the WWE title. Uh, and then after winning the Royal Rumble, he says... Uh, the, could, there's a Senate, maybe there's whoever the Universal Champion is says no. I don't want that crappy belt. I want the WWE Championship. I want Nakamura, and then he gets moved over that way. Yeah, I mean, and, and I would love to see. I don't know how it would work, 
and I don't even know if it'd be great or great a match, but just the names, Nakamura and John Cena in a match. Oh, I think I think it would you would actually get Nakamura trying and not just resting on his charisma, which he does have a tendency to do. And you John Cena, you put him in there with someone who is who's really freaking good and he will rise to the occasion. If John Cena is the best guy in the ring, you're in trouble. If John Cena is trying to keep up with someone that he knows is a lot better than him, then he he performs. So yeah, Nakamura and John Cena would be would be an awesome match. I would love to see that. Uh, but yeah, if if they uh, AJ and Nakamura had a basically rematch at WrestleMania, and especially if they even had the if they had the nerve to say these two fought in to- in the Tokyo Dome in front of 60,000 people and they're doing it again now here at re- at the biggest show of them all at WrestleMania in front of 75,000 or however many they're going to claim are there that would be a great story um my the reason why I don't want AJ going to Raw is I don't trust the booking in Raw because they haven't proven to do a very good job Maybe they'll improve that, but if it's a temporary thing and he wins the Royal Rumble and then heads back to SmackDown, I would be totally fine with that. Um, but I like the the handshake and then him still fucking with Shane, so they they set the seeds that he could it could go either way. I thought, uh, and then we had the main main event: uh, Bray Wyatt and Eric Rowan taking on Luke Harper and Randy Orton. Uh, I lo- the best part of this match was Harper's hot tag at one point, and he came in. He was a barrel fire. Otherwise, this I don't remember a damn thing about this. Luke Harper's super over. That's yep. it. That's all I can say. He was definitely more over than Randy or- Orton. Yep, not surprising. I mean, in that match, I can honestly say not a lot of people cared. Yeah, I can see that. It was... I mean, they got... They got like, it was like, oh, God, can we get to uh, Nakamura and Dolph Ziggler? <sighs> <laughs> like, really? It was like, no one cared about this match. And I'm not I'm not putting it on Randy. I'm really not putting it on Randy. Uh, I, I put it on how much the match disappointed Sunday night. We were looking for more, and we didn't get it. And I think, as far as this fan base, this WrestleMania fan base, they do hold grudges. Yep. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, after this, uh, you know, we're going to go back and talk about 205 Live. It was actually a pretty short show. But we had Nakamura versus Dolph Ziggler. And, of course, take Nakamura striking and put Dolph Ziggler selling with it. That should tell you how awesome of a match it was. Oh, man. Why couldn't that have been on the network or on YouTube or something? Yeah, it was only about 10 minutes long, of course. It was just, it was literally, they announced the match to get people to stay for 205 Live. Because it was just a very quick match. You'll probably get it next week on SmackDown. And, honestly, you'll probably get Nakamura versus Dolph next week on SmackDown. So, it was a really good match. Nakamura, of course, won with his finisher. I never know how to say, is it Kinasa? Kinshasa. Kinshasa, there you go. And he won with his finisher, and, you know, we all left. Uh, but before <laughs> that happened, we can move on to 205 Live. Yes, all right. So, 205 Live, what happened? It, I didn't see it. Very short show. Uh, Tazawa and Brian Kendrick started off. Uh, Cesara, Tazawa uh, faked the ankle injury and then pinned Brian Kendrick and then got on the mic and said, Rule one, I got you. So he he basically used... Brian Kendrick's whole rules against him to pin him, which I thought was pretty cool. And Tazal's English is actually, I know it's better than what he does on the show. So that was kind of funny. At some point, they brought out all the UK tourney people. They all debuted. Okay. And and, um, they may explain it on TV. I don't know why. They did it on NXT, too. I just didn't understand why they were there. Unless they're doing some kind of UK invasion angle. I don't know. It was very weird. Because you, know, you can't hear what the announcers are saying. Right. It just looks like four guys just coming out on stage for no reason. It, 
you know, probably some of it has to do with, hey, we've got them here anyway, and uh, we don't want them on at progress shows, so let's put them here. They all work <laughs> progress shows this weekend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, that was the one uh, company I just thought the name of. Uh, yeah. But they, yeah. they they all work progress as progress as I've been told it's called. They all work their shows this weekend. So I like I said, I don't get it. All I know is the Bruiser Way P Dunn was the most overdue by a long shot. I saw it. Tons of his shirts. Every time they said his name, everyone would cheer. He's a thing. Well, good. I'm glad he's getting over. Uh, he's way more over than Tyler Bate. <laughs> That's not surprising. It's, it's not even close. Uh, yeah, Tyler beating his white meat baby face, which I got to meet most of the UK roster this weekend, if you saw my pictures. Uh, 205 and 205 Live in the UK, I think I met. In the UK, I met all the people that they had, except Wolfgang, and I don't know if he did a signing. And 205 Live, it was only Gentleman Jack Gallagher and Tazawa that I didn't get to see. Okay, well, you got some. You got to meet some good folks. I did. Yeah. Very and, impressive. Uh, Neville comes out, says how awesome he is, blah, blah, blah. Sets up, and then he does commentating for the four, Fatal 4-Way match. It was a really, really good Fatal 4-Way match uh, with Austin Aries winning, of course. Uh, I would have, I, again, I'm going to say TJP, they need to do something with him because I feel like he's getting lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Yeah. They need yeah, to do something with he him. Was the, he was the face of the division, and now he might need to be the heel of the division or something. They need to do change his character a little bit. Uh, maybe do a thing where his confidence is going down or something like that. He needs his own type of storyline to get to make him relevant again. Yeah, good call. Um, anything else from 205 Live? Uh, no. All right. Um, so, while, okay, spoilers warning. Anyone who does not want to hear spoilers, uh, fast forward now. Uh, let's talk about the NXT tapings that you went to. Okay. So, what happened? All right. Um, uh, okay, I'm trying to get it all straightened in my head because uh, they... They take three shows, but they don't necessarily take them in the order that they're going to show them on the show. So Drew Galloway uh, or Drew McIntyre debuted with new music, and it was pretty freaking amazing. Okay, good. And, and he uh, he actually had two matches that night. Of course, he won both. Uh, he's doing the uh, the stomp and then the kick. He's doing the kick as his finisher. Okay. He's not used to Future Shock, which is not shocking because it's basically Dean Ambrose's move, but it was his move first. I'd rather Dean Ambrose change moves than him not use it, but whatever. Um, um, let's see. Nakamura comes out to say goodbye, and apparently that's going to be the end of next week's show. And he just says how he will... He loved the fans and the people, and he will always be NXT. And then the whole crowd, I put this picture on the club, the whole crowd uh, came out and uh, came out to, and I mean, not the crowd, uh, the whole locker room came out, except Bobby Roode and clapped for him as he went off, the, uh, went off into the land of SmackDown. Then you see a uh, Ty Dillinger interview, and he uh, says he has to uh, he has to uh, got one more piece of unfinished business before he leaves, and he's going to wrestle Eric Young in a steel cage to main event next week's NXT, which you don't know which one it was. Like I said, it's kind of it's kind of funny with how they do it do it because you don't know when is when is going on. There was an Authors of Pain versus uh, Roderick Strong and Cassius Ono. Oh. Uh, a match. Authors of Pain, of course, won. It was very much like back and forth on it. No more debuts. Uh, Drew, Drew uh, Pintar was the debut. Uh, oh! Alistair Black had two matches. One match, he literally 
put his hands behind his head and kick the dude in the head and pinned him. That was it. Last three seconds. <laughs> and then the other one, he actually wrestled a little bit, and then he kicked him in the head. So, I mean, and his entrance and his music. I don't know if you've heard the music. It's freaking amazing. Alistair Black's. Yeah. I rem- I remember hearing it at Takeover. I just don't. I know yeah, I've heard I, it. I don't can't think of it right now. Yeah, and you're gonna probably be like, "This is some band that they ripped off." Blah blah blah. I don't. I, you know, I don't know. That kind of, you that that's your thing. That is your. You can hear some music and be like, "Hey, they ripped off that guy." Yeah. So uh, I can't do that. So it was really good music though. It was very ominous and dark, and they kept doing this thing where he would literally walk off into the black. Like you couldn't see him, and it was Alistair Black school. I'm, I mean, I'm a fan. Uh, I'm a fan of his character. Yeah, I, I need to see more Aaron one to become a fan of that. Uh, but yeah, that is the report. Uh, the crowd was heavy. I got to experience the NXT crowd trying to get themselves over. I don't like it. So. <laughs> That was probably my last chance, the last uh, go around at full sail. Or if I do go, I would go to where I'm at, like the top of the ramp, where I don't have to be involved in that. They were really, really trying to get themselves over. Let's start a chant. Let's start a chant. Let's start a chant. It was annoying. It felt like if they weren't chanting at all times, something was wrong. And then you had the guys there. Yeah, you know they go to every show. So they kind of know the wrestlers and stuff, and like literally walking around like they got the big swing in D's. You know what I'm saying? Oh my God. Was Izzy there? Yes, Izzy was there. Oh, I, see, I can't Izzy, meet Izzy. Izzy was like pretty much at everything I was at the whole weekend. And uh, a friend of the club, Glenn, uh, um, they, they, her and Izzy are really they seem tight. They they hang out and all that stuff. So Izzy was she was really cool. She had Izzy Mania uh, wristbands that she was handing out. Uh, it was kind of cool. Uh, oh, but that's awesome. Yeah, yeah was... she seems cool. She's a little, she's a little star, and, and, and I... she's very nice about it. And very, I mean, she, her parents are very humble. It's not like they they think they're the shit. They get in line just like everybody else. We even offered them a couple times to come up and come up and. Uh, Get, get in front of us, they turned it down uh, they basically get in line just like everyone else and and it was funny because they were talking to us and I guess and like I said, I don't believe I was there for this somebody was like, well she gets a cut because she's Izzy and they were like, no they she, they were just talking to friends and then they went back to the end of the line because they're just regular fans I don't, like I said, if they have anything with the WWE, they don't act like it they get in line just like everyone else. It seems like they they even overcompensate. Like they don't like regular people would jump in line with their friends, right? But I right. think they go out of their way not to do it as to not draw attention to themselves. See, that's really good, and that's also with all the the exposure that Izzy's gotten. That's a really great example for her, so she doesn't grow up real super conceited. Uh, because being as totally adorable as she is, that could end up going a really bad prima donna route, and I'm glad that they're trying to keep her humble. So that's awesome. And you know, all, all weekend I kept, I was like, they're in Orlando. Why haven't they shown Izzy on TV yet? Did they not get good seats? Because I kept, I kept looking around. I was like, where's Izzy in the crowd? I don't see Izzy anywhere. Um, but you know, I figured uh, she was there somewhere. Yeah, uh, when we did the Orlando Eye meeting with Bailey, my last of my four horse women that I needed, uh, she had her title and she was dressed like Bailey. And Bailey and her did the first cl- uh, women's title clink me. Nice. And all Very I nice. Said, that's trademark infringement. Uh, I need y'all to give the revival some money. <laughs> yeah. You. Well, the Hardys need to do that too because they've been clinking the belts. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like this whole clinking thing. That's what the revival do, and they started that whole clink me. I'm not saying they're the first people to ever clink their belts. I think they were the first people to call it that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, I think people have been tapping belts since there've been belts, but they were the first person to say clink me, you know, the kind of thing. 
Yeah, so one thing on um, possible people who might be debuting in in NXT, uh, there are rumors that Bobby Root or not Bobby Root, Bobby Fish has decided to stay with um, with Ring of Honor. There's also reports that uh, Adam Cole has reconciled with the Bullet Club, leading to suspicion that maybe he has re-signed with Ring of Honor. Do you think uh, either of these are true? Uh, uh, Bobby Fish is important. Yeah. I don't see him going to the WWE unless they're going to do the Red Dragon, which, again, he's 40. So, I, I, I to me... I think it's best that he stays where he's at. He's getting a steady paycheck. He's a main face on. He's the main a main face on the roster, as in face as in a person, not right. the guy. And uh, Adam Cole, he's twenty nine. So if he wants to take another year, tie up his uh, tie up his um, uh, his storylines. He wants to have a few memorable matches with Kenny Omega. You know what? Go for it. Why not? It's a year. Yeah, and he there's I, he mentioned once on Sam Roberts' podcast that you know his dream of dreams would be to main event both a Wrestle Kingdom and a WrestleMania. Oh. So if he really is serious about that, then if Kenny Omega gets the IWGP title at some point, he could challenge, maybe go face. And the, they could have a feud, um, and that would be—I'd uh, be okay with that. I'd take my money, uh, so I, w- I would be down with that. Um, yeah, um, don't get me wrong—I'm I'm down for it. Whatever. Uh, Adam Cole is super talented. He's friend of KO, so you know KO seems to look out for his friends. I'm not saying that they're not talented on their own, but you know you got uh, you got Steve Carino came uh, came over and. Him. It was uh, Owens, Jimmy Jacobs, and Carino. They took a picture at WrestleMania together. So he t- he looks out for his friends. Don't get me wrong, but you know. So I think the door is always going to be open for Adam Cole. He's just that name. Yeah, and he's he's the kind of guy I could see WWE wanting anyway. And so. there, he, and I imagine he's going to get to keep his name. Oh, he freaking better. The three-time ROH World Champion when he has gets pops the way he does, he better keep his name. Well, um, Tom Sanders was a big name in UK. Yeah, that... Luckily for him... I, mean, I mean, his new name is cooler. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I like his new name way better than his uh, previous name, but I'm just saying, he was a big name in the UK. And, you know, they, they don't... Uh, they made him change it. Yeah, yeah, but there's. For but Pete Dunn got Pete Dunn gets to keep his name. So yeah, that's so weird. And it, 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 yeah, I don't. Who know that that whole thing is? You never know anymore. Um, I, I think some of because Tommy End didn't come in with the UK tournament. That's why he didn't keep his name. Except when he Neville wrestled at the UK tournament, he wrestled as Tommy End. Yeah. Um. Because you know it was in UK and everything, uh, and so introducing him to an American audience as Alistair Black, he has a much cleaner slate than Adam Cole coming over is a known commodity more so. Uh, so it would it would make more sense for him to keep his name. Um, so that is uh, that's pretty much that. Oh, re- on the Drew Galloway McIntyre thing, apparently that was really last minute and kind of. Uh, kind of screwed over Evolve a little bit. They had to do a lot of rebooking uh, changes to their shows um, at the last minute because of that whole thing. But that came that came about that, and apparently the Jim Ross thing came about pretty quickly. Um, one thing before we move out of WWE land, because uh, I know you're caught up on Impact. I want to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, this whole situation with Mauro Ronaldo, what are your thoughts on this? Oh, my God. I've heard, Let's see. He has a disease. Uh, he's bipolar, of course. I feel bad for him being bipolar, and I literally, he is my favorite announcer, without a doubt. Um, and from his point of view, I have a disease. You knew about it. 
occasionally it's going to make it where I can't work. And I think that was the whole point of the Tom Phillips thing. You know, Tom Phillips can step in where Mauro Ronaldo is, and that's great. Um, so in that kind of, I'm all I'm behind Mauro all the way. I, I I think losing him to the WWE could be the worst thing ever. As far as the rumored bullying of JBL, uh, from JBL tomorrow, let me say this. Uh, from what I understand, to me, it, it's almost to the point where you've heard it from so many sources that you can't call it rumors anymore. Yeah, I, I'm there with you, and and you, you, just, I mean, it's always a rumor, but it's it's substantiated from people that work with the WWE now. Yeah, and is anyone honestly, truly going to be shocked to learn that JBL? is a bit of a bully and a dick, honestly. From what I understand, he's not a bit of a bully. He's yeah. like an unbearable bully. So basically, where it seemed to in- trigger a bipolar episode on Mark. And, you know, if that is really the case, and, and I know for whatever reason, JBL, he must have some dirt on Vince to be able to walk on water the way he does in that company. But someone there needs to pull him aside and go. This can't. This can't happen anymore. We Vince are... comes from seventies wrestlers. Vince yeah. comes from an old person. I mean, from an old person's point of view of wrestling, where there were older guys, there were younger guys, there were tough guys, and bullying yeah. and locker room stuff was a part of the culture. Yeah, but this is where Vince Vince can either have his cake or he can eat it too. He is either an entertainment company that is really a movie studio that happens to produce a show that's wrestling, or it is an old school wrestling company. Shit or get off the pot, Vince, uh, well, because your lawyers are going to tell you, uh, no, this is an entertainment company that has shareholders, and you can't allow this shit to happen because this is a lawsuit waiting to happen and you will lose and righteously so oh and and i truly think if someone has the balls to go after vince that he would lose but who's gonna go after vince i could see morrow doing it i can't see morrow doing it i can't why he was gonna do it to me he would be out and doing it now well see here's the thing though he is his mental image, I mean, mental illness, the WWE could go right after him and say it wasn't that bad. He just saw it as that bad because of his illness. Yeah, they would have to have the burden of proof there. And he could he could bring up the whole unsafe work environment, which has been, you can corroborate with things like uh, Bill DeMont in the Performance Center. He created an unsafe work environment, something that's been fostered over years. A really good lawyer could make a, a great case. And as far as that's concerned, you know uh, New Japan would give in Morrow end, in a, a in job in a heartbeat. JBL will just step away. Yeah. JBL's always about what's best for business. And, you know, there was the Nazi salute thing he did. He stepped away. He's going, he'll, he'll step away. He'll call you stupid for having your opinion. And then he'll step away. Because that's what JBL does. If you have an opinion that differs from him, you're an idiot. Yeah, that's probably why Vince likes him so much, because he likes bullies assholes. Because, I mean, that's what he is. He's a bully. I mean, that's what he's going to do. Oh, you don't agree with what I'm saying? You're dumb. So, you're an idiot, and I'm JBL, and I've made a lot of money in this business, so I'm better than you for some reason. I'm like, in which JBL would punch me in the face. Because all I would tell him is, you're an actor. I mean, you might actually legitimately be tough, but you're an actor. That's all you are. You play a role on TV. That's what you are. Yep. I mean, in the end, that's what, I mean, all my favorite wrestlers and people, I love them, don't get me wrong, they're actors. And so, uh, that being said, I don't see the need for this bullying, uh, and I don't see the need for it. I I wish Mauro and Nalo the best, but I can't say. Like I said, you've heard it. I read enough books 
and JBL's name is thrown out there enough where it's like, well, I think this guy might be a bully. Yep. So uh, so let's go ahead and get out of WWE and, and talk a little bit about the uh, the company formerly known as TNA before we get out of here. Oh. Um, so you you have been watching some uh, some of the uh, the impact lately. What, what are your yes. thoughts? Yesterday, since I was out of town for a long time, yesterday I've watched the last two episodes. These are the things I like. I like the main storyline of JV versus Josh Matthews. Josh Matthews is a natural heel. It's kind of like that old Michael Cole, J, uh, Jerry Lawler storyline. They're using it to announce some new old characters, which is genius. Uh, in this case, they brought their uh, establishing Bram as a singles competitor again. They brought back uh, they brought back the Blueprint, Matt Morgan. They brought back Magnus. And I forgot the other guy. I don't know, I'm, I'm I'm drawing a blank. But that's uh, it's our team, Alberto uh, team uh, JB as in Jeremy Borash versus uh, team uh, Josh Matthews. His team is like Bobby Lashley. Um, uh, why am I drawing a blank now? I actually brought up the list earlier so I could talk about this. Uh, but his uh, Bobby Lashley is on his uh, team. Um, uh, Eli Drake, Tyrus, and let's see. I'm missing one person. <laughs> Bringing up the list right now. Uh, uh, forgive me because I had it up, and then when my computer had issues earlier, it went away. So just give me another moment. But I like that part of it. Is interesting wrestlers. Braxton Sutter is obviously the new star that they're trying to get behind. I have no idea which he, if he has it, which generally means he doesn't. <laughs> uh, the need to get rid of they need to get rid of the Impact Grand Champion rules. They just suck. Uh, everything's building the Slam anniversary. I guess they're trying to build that as that kind of WrestleMania thing. If it was in or if I could make it to Orlando, I would probably go. LAX is the tag champs and Conan as main kind of group is what they need. And I really dig Rosemary as a champion, uh, as the women's champion. Those are the things I like. Um, I am of the opinion, and I've been saying this for a few weeks, you're not going to know what Impact Wrestling is for three months. You're not. You're gonna have to lay them, let them lay the foundation and big uh, build their new stars uh, before uh, you can really, you can uh, really, um, you know, say whether it's good or not. So Team JB is Alberto Del, El, Alberto El Patron, Magnus, Matt Morgan, and Chris Adonis, which used to be Chris Masters. Uh, Team Goat or Team James uh, or Team Matthews is um, Bobby Lashley, Bram. I actually did say his name. So Bobby Lashley, Bram, uh, Eli Drake, and Tyrus. So you're establishing, you're bringing back Matt Morgan, Chris Adonis, and Magnus, who haven't been on the show recently. So you're bringing the, you're, you're using this to bring those three back all at the same time. And then you have you're reestablishing Bram. He was in the DCC, so you're reestablishing him as a a big guy, as a main event guy. And then you have Eli Drake and Tyrus, which they're a team together. I imagine someone on Team JB is going to turn on them because to me this line only storyline only works is you know Josh Matthews wins. So I don't know. I like what they're doing. I, cause I can see what it's leading to, and Impact Wrestling was such shit that you couldn't just say, "Hey, we're we're gonna determine all new champions." WCW tried to do it; it didn't work. So you're gonna have to kind of gradually get away from the old storylines and get to the new ones. EC3 came out this week and basically said he's going back to being his old self, EC3. Everyone knows how much I love uh, Ethan Carter III. So 
I truly believe that's leading into him turning heel. And it might end up being him helping Josh Matthews' team win, but I don't know how they're going to do it. All right. Yeah, our uh, club member and good friend Ryan is not a fan at all of the impact right now. But uh, he hates it. Dixie. He, he even said he misses Dixie. But you know what? You can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. So it might be ugly for a few weeks, But which I don't even think it was ugly. I just think you have to get to a point where you have that main storyline to keep you tied in. And right now they don't have it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh very good. And he hates Matt Switch. You know, like he says he presses mute so he can watch the T V. But the thing is, Josh Matthews is a heel. And he's such a heel that he makes you press mute so you don't have to hear him. Heel he <laughs> That is true. It was funny yesterday when uh we Steve and I were driving to the concert. Um we talked about this, and uh, and, he, and Steve was like, "Yeah, Ryan, Ryan likes the Dixie years." And I, my response was, "Yeah, said no wrestling fan ever." Yeah. Uh, so it was, yeah. That we'll see what happens. I still haven't watched it. I still hate the six sided ring. Uh, so I'll have to, I'll have to get over that. You're gonna hate that forever. I am. I really, I, really I am. Six sided ring. I don't know how it is on the wrestlers or if they can re-engineer it to where it's not as hard on the wrestlers, but it needs to be different from the WWE to me. Fair enough. I, I will see to that point. Um, but uh, that was that. Um, I do not remember us discussing a top five, so I don't think we have one for this week. We did not. We should come up for it. I was going to say we should come up with a top five for next week. Um so, uh, yeah. I would like to do, I don't know if you have an idea, but I actually thought about this over the past couple of days. I would like to do our top five WrestleMania 34 dream matches. You know, you just read my mind, actually. Uh, I was thinking something along the same thing. So, uh, yeah, we can do that. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, top five matches we want to see next year at WrestleMania. Um, excellent. Definitely. Honorable mentions, but uh, and you might even hear one wrestler in the list more than once, just because you feel like they can do anything with anyone. So, but uh, yeah, it's I think that would be a great list, uh, especially. Uh, we just got through a Romania 33, um, but uh, yeah, looking forward to that. All right, and do you have a Hall of Fame uh, inductee this week? Not this week. Okay. Um, Next week, I plan on having it. Again, very busy week. And then when I got back, I, re- I I just left my girlfriend for 13 days. It's last couple days has been all about spending time with her before I have to head back to the work uh, work tomorrow. And that makes perfect sense. That you know, and you you need to spend time with your lady friend. So uh, so everyone's got to get reacquainted and all that goodness. Uh, so that's going to do it for Around the Ring this week. Uh, you can check out our homepage. We actually have a cool URL now. Go to aroundtheringok.com. No more WordPress in there. Uh, and you can head over to the homepage where you will find links to everything, including where you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker. Uh, you can find links to our Facebook page, our Twitter. It's all there in one-stop shopping so go check that out. Uh, Floyd Johnson Jr., where can people find you online? I am on Facebook. You can just find my name, Floyd Johnson Jr. I generally uh, I generally only add people I actually know. So I will, you might not, if you put in a request for me, you might get a, um, a request from the club because that's where I generally keep my wrestling stuff. Or Twitter, Floyd Johnson Jr. You can communicate me through it uh, with me there. Those are my basic social media ones that I actually use. There you go. All right, and you can find me on on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Oklahoma Lefty. And that's going to do it for this week. We will be back next week with a top five and a uh, Floyd Johnson Jr.'s Around the Ring Hall of Fame inductee and whatever happens in the world of wrestling between now and then. So uh, everyone out there, you take care. Have a great week. Be safe. And we'll see you guys next Sunday. Have a good one, guys.
You've been listening to Around the Ring on the Spark Radio Network. All you have to do is change your point of view. And Bo Reed. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. Bam! Woo! That sucks more than anything that I've ever fucked before. What? It's the charity. <laughs>